the 1870s, the federal government, partly in order to meet its obligations to educate Aboriginal children, began to play a role in the development and administration of these schools. Two primary objectives of the residential school system were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their home, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some saw it, as was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. Today, we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong, has caused great harm, and has no place. John Brown had a little Indian. John Brown had a little Indian. John Brown had a little Indian. One little Indian boy. One little two. My name is uh, Edmund Tatawaban, and I'm from uh, Fort Albany First Nation. I went to St. Anne's uh, Residential School, entered when I was six, and I was uh, there for eight years from 1956 to 1963. I remember the, uh, the few days before entering the school because there's a lot of uh, whispering and my mother was not in a very happy state. She was crying a lot. And finally I, uh, I, was, uh, I put on my uh, best outfit and my uh, best jacket and I was taken outside and my father said, okay, let's go, hasta luego. We learned to expect um, some form of assault from the caretakers. There was an electric chair uh, that was used for fun. Later was taken to the girls' dormitory for disciplinary purposes. <coughs> when it was for fun, we were placed in the chairs and uh, we couldn't even touch the floor. Then current was applied, everybody was, you know, went spastic, and uh, everybody was laughing, uh, the visitors were laughing. It was entertainment. The very first year when I went in, like I didn't know anybody there. Everything was scary for me because uh, I had never seen the nuns the way they dressed before and all of a sudden there's those people. There was nowhere to go. So you kept s silent and you dealt with this on your own. And you're dealing with these issues as a child. So you develop your own techniques to deal with it. When the sun goes down, then that's when visitors that are not supposed to be visiting the school arrive. On their part, it was um, behavior that was okay. If the bishop was uh, doing it, the staff is okay for the staff to do it. And we were the children that were helpless to do anything about it because there was nobody to help. 
So those are part of normal activities for them, and, <coughs> and they didn't seem to feel guilty about it. Mm. And uh, so, a sexual abuse, yes, a lot of that stuff by different people on children. And children are very young, girls and boys. One girl uh, we know that was within our, our age group, uh, she got pregnant from the uh, bishop. I thought I was going to be with my sister. My sister was with me, my oldest sister. And uh, as soon as we get in into the room, my sister was pulled away from me, tried to hang on to her, and I was crying. Didn't know, didn't know what to think. My name is Angela Shishish. The first year I went to school was in 19... 52 going on 53. We were transported in a barge, a little barge, from uh, Arawapska to Fort Albany. At that time, I got really scared then, not knowing what had happened, what will happen, what I'm gonna be meeting. All I wanted was my parents to be with me. And I remember my number was number eight. And the girl that next to me, she had number seven. I was halfway eating my porridge. I got sick right there. And next thing I know, somebody came and pulled my hair in the nun with that spoon and they told me, I, I didn't want it to eat it, but they sort of forced that spoon in me and and I, and they made me eat of it, ate my porridge. And I was crying. Nobody to protect me, nobody to, you know. When you're inside another kind of environment, and everything is different, and everything is harsh, and everything unloving, mm -hmm. and cruel. Like, you, you were assaulted, so you know that's wrong. So you immediately know that the situation is not right. So what you do? You learn to adapt. Mm -hmm. You become invisible. We are made to feel like we're criminals or the ones that are at fault. Well, we didn't do this. The government did this to us. My name is Evelyn Corkmass. I come from the community of Fort Albany where St. Anne's Residential School was. And I went to school there um, from 1969 to 1972. In my IAP claim, I'm a, a student on student abuse. I was not abused by any uh, employer or employee of the school. I was abused by students, and this happened for the four years I was there. I grew up uh, very resentful of my people because of w the harms that they had done to me. And it wasn't until the residential school issue came out that I started to understand why I was abused. And I learned later it was because they were abused. So they continued the abuse. It was the elders that used to tell us uh, all these prophecies. And this is a long time ago in a ceremony, um, an entity came in that had a white collar. And uh, the, the spirit says, 
a very hard time is coming to your children. And a lot of them will die, and a few will survive. And uh, so it's going to become a period of crying for parents. And they said, is there anything we can do to change that? And uh, the, the entity said, no, no, this is it's going to happen. It's supposed to happen because at the end of that period, they will come out and be stronger because of that. At the southern tip of James Bay, about 500 miles north of Toronto, a schoolyard full of activity on a crisp winter day. And the children are Indians, students at the Canadian government school. They removed us from our home, put us in residential school. They were told what was going on in that school, but they chose to look the other way. So now you have to pay your dues. Simple as that. This is a residential school, one of 69 in key locations from the American border to above the Arctic Circle. More than 10,000 children attend these schools, children who, for various reasons, can't go to regular day schools in Indian communities. Take the kids, because they're not suitable to Canadian life cut their hair, change their appearance, take their clothes, and teach them to behave in a way that is acceptable to Canadian society. About 98% of Canada's Indians belong to Christian denominations. Spiritual as well as educational needs are catered to at this flourishing modern school for Canada's young Indians. I walked around for many years thinking, oh my God, I'm the only one that's going through this. But when the conference happened in Fort Albany in 1992, I realized, oh my God, I'm not the only one that's been through this. A lot of crying, because now they were talking about their own experiences. They were children and they had kept that child inside them. And then the child was coming up. I was with people that understood what I went through without having to explain every gory d detail. It felt comfortable to know that I wasn't the only one that was going through this silent abuse. Well, the police believed uh, what they were hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's their job, is to collect uh, evidence. So when they finished, they gave it to the Crown. And now it was the Crown's duty to select the, the criminals from that report. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where something went wrong. But if you have a meaning or your experience or your hardship, you will be able to handle it and come out. Uh, you will survive that experience.
for our parents, our grandparents, great-grandparents, indeed for all of the generations that, which have preceded us, this day testifies to nothing less than the achievement of the impossible. Our interest in those documents is that they implicate a lot of people. And we know they implicate a lot of people, important people. And uh, it's the extent of the crime. I was told that when I was going to go through the IAP process, that I would sit there and tell my story. I might be asked or questioned a couple of questions. Um, but everything was going to be okay. I wasn't going to be re-traumatized. And I felt that that's what happened. It made me upset. Uh, two of my family members were treated like that. My oldest brother, his case was not good enough. His story was not good enough. So they said, we're closing your case. It's not worth it. They are the only ones that have these documents. We've all signed our release forms for you to bring these documents forward for our hearings. Produce them. Let's move on. Let us move on. These crimes happen to us as children. These are crimes done on ch children. Now I'm an elder. Now you're victimizing me as an elder now. You know, when is it going to end? Or is it ever going to end? The album member for Timmins, James Bay. Children at St. Anne's Residential School suffered nightmarish levels of abuse torture and child rape, and yet the Office of the Attorney General suppressed thousands of pages of police evidence that identified those perpetrators, and in doing so, they had cases thrown out and undermined the hearings. And now that the Justice Department has been forced to turn over those documents, they claim it's inadmissible unless a survivor finds a witness to verify these atrocities. To the Prime Minister, enough. The survivors of St. Anne's deserve better. Will he instruct his government to end this obstruction of justice against the survivors of St. Anne's once and for all? My Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the ills done to Indigenous people over decades and centuries of colonialism in this country uh, are uh, shameful and are something that we need to learn from and move forward on. And that includes uh, respecting the rights of Indigenous peoples uh, now in all their different aspects, and that's why we are working with uh, survivors, lurk, working with uh, communities to ensure that we can move forward in a way that is fully respectful of all their rights as we uh, get, uh, get to the bottom of this, uh, understand their history, and uh, make reparations in the right way moving forward. For whatever reason, the Justice Department of Canada, the department that's there to uphold the rule of law in Canada, decided to suppress the evidence and go into those hearings and lie. And when they were found out, the whole system went to protect them and not the survivors. I don't understand why the government is saying we want to re re reconcile with the Aboriginal people and not bring forth all the tools that are needed to do this.
because I don't want anybody to go through that in life. What we went through has hits that were there. One from Althea LeBlanc blacked out. Also Althea LeBlanc blacked out. Page 3309. Withheld. I don't know why there has been such an effort to obstruct justice here. But that's what this is. This is an obstruction of the, of the rights of the survivors of some of the worst abuse in Canada. And these thousands of pages of blacked out documents only raises questions as to what is going on in the government of Canada that they're so afraid of St. Anne's. They're hiding the documents. They're redacting the documents. I think the focus should be that uh, the story about residential school uh, was uh, very serious, but it's not over. You're just calling it by another name. We have seen a government that has used their lawyers to suppress evidence, to use all manner of legal tactics to blockade the most basic rights of justice for survivors. And it has been the survivors of St. Anne's who have stood up time and time and time again and said that if reconciliation is going to be real in this country, it has to be made real with the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School. It's really sad to see the government of Canada, when they talk about reconciliation, when they talk about justice, and this is how they treat our people. This is a ground zero reconciliation and in order for Canada to finally get this done uh, correctly, it has to address all survivors' issues across the country, including St. Anne's here today. We still have a, a long way to go to ensuring that we have the uh, ears of the uh, government because we are continually being tripped up by uh, the lawyers of the church and the uh, government. We've been here for 10,000 years on this uh, um, Turtle Island and we will continue to be here for a long time. So we're, we're not rushing, but we will continue to say what we have to say. I'm going to bleed you, boy. It's an industry that's kind of ripe for imposters because there's a need for native stories out there, but there's not a lot of people that can tell them, particularly behind the camera. I think what we're going to see is a tsunami of storytellers that is going to come forward within the next couple of years. 